uh, Hugh Weldon, who was uh, uh, the head of programmes in BBC in 1965, invited me uh, to become controller of BBC Two, and it was a complete surprise. I had no ambitions to go into uh, television administration. I was uh, making uh, documentary programmes, mostly about natural history and travel. But it was a very exciting prospect. BBC Two at the time was less than a year old. It hadn't yet uh, got its editorial policies clear and accepted. It was clear to me that, that BBC Two had to be innovative. That was one thing. The second thing I knew uh, was that it also, for technical reasons, would be the first network in Britain to go into colour. Uh, all the other networks, um, and there was only ITV and BBC One, uh, they were on an ancient uh, technical standard of 405 lines. Uh, the new horizon, the new land, was going to be 625, which of course is what we're on now. Um, and uh, the BBC Two would be engineered to this standard and would be the first. Uh, a complicated business because it involved building a completely new set of transmitters uh, all over Britain. But that brought a huge uh, opportunity because precisely because we were 625 lines and therefore as it were the television of the future uh, it would be on BBC Two uh, that colour television was going to be introduced. The problem was that uh, colour television had a very bad reputation. Uh, it had started in America several years before and was I think a catastrophe. I think everybody was agreed. The colour was garish and appalling. Uh, the, the variability from between sets and sets was horrible. Uh, the programming tried to exploit colour in a rather crude way and it was such a disaster that in fact it shut down. So there were actually people in the country who were saying, do we really want colour television? Well, the BBC had been experimenting with colour for a long time um, and learning by American mistakes, the engineers had now got a new version of colour uh, that I was convinced, uh, having seen some of the experimental work, was going to be really thrilling and produce pictures which were fully comparable with the kind of colour pictures that colour printing, for example, could produce at that time. Um, so I had a number of jobs on. I mean, I, I had to have uh, tasks to try and convince people to buy new sets, 65 lines, but even to buy colour television sets. To do that, uh, I thought I needed to convince people, uh, I mean, opinion formers, as you might say, um, that actually colour was worth having, that it wasn't garish and horrible and ghastly. So I had the notion that we should be able to create a series which would look at all the most beautiful pictures and buildings um, that human beings in Western Europe had created in the past 2,000 years and put them on television accompanied uh, by appropriate music, music that had been written at that particular time. OK, then who are you going to invite uh, to put this out? Well, in my mind, there was just one name, uh, and there wasn't any doubt about it. Uh, Kenneth Clark. Uh, he wasn't yet Lord Clark. Uh, I mean, he was Sir Kenneth Clark. He was known to everybody who knew him as K. Clark. Uh, and he uh, had an, exactly the sort of background that you wanted. He had been, during the war, an innovative uh, director of the National Gallery. Um, uh, arranging uh, concerts during the war and had a huge reputation from that point of view. He was the author of scholarly books about landscape, about uh, the nude. Um, he was an expert on Leonardo, but he was also interested in television. Uh, he had become the first chairman of the, Interna of the uh, Independent Television Authority, much, I may say, to uh, BBC chagrin, I think. I mean, they thought that Kay Clark was essentially a BBC man rather than an ITV man. But ITV, in particular Lou Grade of Rediffusion, uh, had took Kay Clark to their hearts and saw that he brought real distinction and had done a number of series with him. None of which, I have to say, um, uh, great, got great audiences on ITV, and they didn't really sit very happily in ITV's schedules, I don't think. Uh, 
As far as I know, he hadn't done any television for the BBC at that time. Um, so I decided that we would write to him and ask him to come to lunch to try and float this idea. And for the lunch to join me, uh, I asked Stephen Hurst, who was the head of music and arts at the time, we were going to float this idea. Uh, I remember the lunch very well because I was very nervous about it all. Um, but Kay Clark, in his, uh, in his memoirs, um, says that while I was trying to sell this idea, uh, I used the word civilization. And that when I did, this struck some kind of chord in his mind. And he says that he immediately started writing on the back of the menu. Uh, some ideas, and as it were, went into a different world and left the rest of us jabbering away between ourselves. This lunch was at the television centre, and half, uh, after it was over, just while we were having coffee and thinking about things, uh, the door burst in, and, and it was Hugh Weldon who burst through every door, really, and I didn't open any door quietly. And he came in and sat down, how's it going on, chaps? It was very enthusiastic, and then breezed out again. Um, I'm not sure that, that Kay knew precisely who had come in and who had left. Um, but, it, but it certainly made it perfectly clear that everybody in the BBC uh, hierarchy was, was in favour of this idea. Uh, he went away um, and, uh, and wrote me a letter saying that he, he didn't think he could do it. But it was not... It was not a... Not a definite letter. It wasn't, a, it wasn't the letter from someone who was absolutely sure that he wasn't going to do it. It was the letter of someone who had some reservations. I'm pretty sure that the reservations that he had at that time uh, were, were private ones, were family ones. Not that we weren't serious about the series, but that he knew he was approaching 70. Um, and he had a notion, which he expressed to me at one stage, that um, 70 uh, somehow was going to be the end of his intellectual life, and that after 70 he was never going to be able to say anything worthwhile, and he was not going to be able to write a serious book after 70. Um, speaking as one who's after 70 now, I'm sorry, to, <laughs> sorry that he held that view, but I'm sure he did. And uh, Lady Clark was, was very keen that there were other major works that he should do, uh, literary works, scholarly works, before moving into this thing called television, which at the time she did thought very little of, I think. Um, and so I then had to go away uh, to look at colour television because that in America and Japan, and I left it uh, then to Hugh Weldon and to Humphrey Burton, who was then head of arts. Um, and it was they who, who kept the screws on Kay Clark, and eventually uh, Kay agreed to do it. The next question was, um, how would we do it? I was so nervous uh, about um, quality um, that when the, uh, uh, a man called Richard Corson, who was our expert advisor on colour film on the staff, came and said, look, we really aren't confident enough of 16mm film at that time to risk uh, going on uh, filming it on that gauge, which is, of course, half the size, a quarter the size of normal cinema film. Uh, he said, the systems aren't good enough, we'll have to do it on 35mm, which put up the budget very, very substantially. But I agreed to that because uh, quality was essential. The next thing was, uh, who would we get to direct such a thing? And uh, Michael Gill and Peter Montagnan were people in the arts department. Well, um, Peter Montanian came, in fact, from uh, educational television, from schools television. Michael Gill was a very distinguished uh, arts producer. And they came on board. Well, eventually, um, Kay Clark was persuaded. Uh, and he was introduced to Michael Gill. And Michael Gill, as well as being a very, very able uh, uh, producer, 
is, a, is nonetheless a very firm man, very strong ideas, and in a sense a brave man. I mean, uh, Clark was a daunting figure, um, but Clark submitted his first draft, and, uh, and Michael Gill said it was hopeless. I'm sorry, I mean, it's just like a lantern, lantern slide lecture. It doesn't use television in the way it should be used, and so on and so on. And, and told him to go away and think of a different draft. Quite a brave thing to do, to such a world figure as Kay Clark. But I think in his arguments, Michael um, uh, was so persuasive, and Kay Clark himself was, had sufficient humility to know that he was moving into a, a new category of documentary, really, under Peter and Michael's guidance. And K. Clark went away and, in fact, um, rewrote the script, and rewrote the script, and rewrote the script, and eventually produced um, the sort of thing that Gill and, and Montanian were looking for. The sort of thoughts, I think, that, that Michael and Peter gave uh, K. was... was how in, how in fact he was going to be placed within the picture, when he was be moving, when was the moment for reflection, and particularly when was the moment when thought, when words had to come to an end, and when the skill of the director could take stills of pictures, of buildings, of landscape, of people, and allow that to be put together in such a imaginative way with the right kind of music uh, that it would make the right kind of impact, not merely a pause between thought, but something that was powerful in itself. And those montages, I think in many ways, when they turn up, are one of the great glories uh, of the series. The first thing, of course, as almost any administrator would say, <laughs> would know, that what's going to happen is that within months they're going to come to you and say, oh, terribly sorry, we're doing all our best, but in fact we're overspending, we're headed for an overspend. Um, and Peter and, and Michael um, certainly did that, but they had the wit to do it after they had shown me a particularly uh, effective um, um, section of a rough cut of, of the pictures being put together. And I recklessly <laughs> in the studio, in the viewing theatre, said, Michael, that's exactly what we're looking for. Absolutely first rate. Wonderful, wonderful. It was that point that Michael said, well, we are overspending. And I could hardly well say, well, that was terrible, you know. But, so, in fact, we decided, I was so encouraged by, by what we saw um, that I thought that if anybody, anybody seeing this would want to see it again. So I decided there and then that we would show each episode uh, twice within the week. And that meant that I could it, as it effectively halved my per hour costs, which was, which was great. Um, it was never in doubt as to, as to how many it was, how many it was going to be. A 13-part series um, fits exactly into a quarter's schedules. Uh, and in those days, we used to plan uh, our yearly output in quarters. And that was sensible and useful because uh, at the end of a quarter, you could make a shift in schedule placing and so on. And what was tedious was if you made a shift in the middle of a, of a seal which was already established. So we used to plan in groups of six with two and, a, and an odd ball, as it were, or a group of 13. And I was anxious that there should be a group of 13. But that in itself, uh, produced uh, something of a problem because um, it wasn't just that um, uh, authored documentaries were scarce and were, were really, and BBC Two's uh, almost private property, hardly anybody else did that sort of thing, but nobody else had done um, a 13 part uh, documentary series of that. It was asking a great deal. There had been a 26-part series, also on BBC Two, about the Great War. But this also documentary, uh, in which one man was going to take the screens of the nations f for 13 consecutive weeks, and what's more, was do it twice a week, um, that was a risk. I was... Um, 
very keen that uh, that K. Clark should appear in Vision, as indeed was Hugh Weldon. Well, we were all keen, and for a very good reason. Uh, one is that there's actually nothing more um, captivating than an informed talking head. I mean, it is it is a very powerful image. In the old days, it used to be that people, uh, television critics, would say, oh, nothing but talking heads. Uh, and talking heads can be some of the very best television ever. But secondly, there was a sort of um, scholarly reason why it was important, that we were very anxious that, that K. Clark should make some kind of assessments to these things. Um, now, inevitably, they're subjective. Uh, there can be no such thing as the definitive objective history of, of painting. Whoever says it brings attitudes to him, unless it's a completely boring programme consisting of nothing but dates. And Kay Clark certainly brought attitudes and opinions to him. Um, and to have any, as it were, intellectual respectability, it had to be clear that this was one person's view. Kay himself was... Uh, very well aware of this, and, and there was one problem he said he had, um, and that was about uh, the contribution Spain had made to the Western civilization. And Clay Clark, he didn't know how to cope with it. I mean, he said to me, he didn't, he said, how was he going to deal with the Inquisition? How was he going to deal with bullfighting? How was he going to deal with many aspects of the Spanish character which didn't fit his particular take on the, the way civilization progressed. Um, and in the end, he decided that what he would do was simply ignore it. Um, and people were outraged, cricketers were outraged, let alone Spanish critics. I mean, <laughs> others were outraged too. Why did he not cover that? Uh, well, that was the reason he didn't, uh, because it didn't fit in. And he got away with it, as it were, because it was subtitled, A Personal View. Very important. He knew, as we all did, um, that it was a success. I mean, as we went along, we could see that it was going well. And Kay, I saw him several times during the proceeding, and Kay said, yes, I, I think it's going, going fine. But none of us had the faintest idea as to how successful it would be. Um, and it was not just a success in this country. I mean, in this country, um, it was one of those sort of legendary things where you know uh, people invite you in to see it, or I won't say the pub shut as far as civilization was concerned, but certainly people had television, color television sets were in the minority, and people had civilization parties in which they invited people round to come and see it both times in the week. So that was great. Um, and, and then it, it, its reputation rapidly spread in a most remarkable way. Um, and uh, we hoped very much it would be shown on American television. But the American television networks, to start with, had no, uh, were uh, not at all keen on picking it up. Um, and so it was then, because it had such a reputation, and because I dare say Kay Clark uh, had contacts, um, what with the National Gallery and one thing or another, uh, it was shown in Washington at the National Gallery of Art. And uh, given each program was given several viewings, and the queues stretched round the gallery, right round the block uh, in Washington to get into this. And Kay uh, went over, I think, for the premiere, but certainly for one of the one of the performances, and, and, and gave an address. And he says in his memoirs um, that he was utterly overwhelmed by the response. That he he walked down through the hall to the cheers and plaudits of people. <laughs> and eventually, in his memoirs, he says, he eventually uh, had to take refuge in the gentleman's lavatories, where he sat and cried, cried for 15 minutes. Um, and, and so that says something about the reception. It also says something about Kay Clark, um, that, that he had, after all, been a scholar. He has, was a scholar, was a great scholar, a great Leonardo scholar. And his applause until that time had been from the scholarly community. And he was utterly unprepared that uh, 
he would be appreciated to that extent by vast numbers of people. And there were vast numbers of people uh, because it simply wasn't just the scholarly community that said it was marvellous. All kinds of people said it marvellous. And, and I was with Kay walking down Piccadilly when people complimented him and, and he was as pleased as Punch. The success uh, of the series within the BBC, with, within the television community, and the BBC in particular, uh, had a great effect, really, um, because that kind of large-scale documentary had not been done before. Um, and it was absolutely clear that uh, here was a new uh, genre uh, which didn't just apply to, uh, to the arts. And um, uh, the head of science programmes came <laughs> when it was when it was already going as I said, absolutely outraged by its success. <laughs> Aubrey Singer, a, a marvellous, a brilliant man, uh, and head of that side of the BBC's non uh, BBC's factual output, thumped on my door and came in and said. I ought to be ashamed of myself. You're supposed to be a man of science, he said. You've got this degree in zoology, and, you know, and you've given this great opportunity to the arts. What are you playing at? I mean, it must be given to science. Well, of course, I, that was fine by me. I mean, so we, uh, and, and there and then, when we uh, one said, OK, we'll do a, a series about, about um, science, which was, uh, in the end, uh, The Ascent of Man with Dr. Bronowski. And then followed that. Um, there was a, a series on uh, a history of America because the bicentennial of the American of America is coming up, and we got that great, great broadcaster, Alistair Cook. He was going to take that, um, and I could see as a broadcaster um, that th the thing that was crying out for that treatment, of course, was natural history. Uh, and then was I. By this time, I had got. Um, pushed upstairs and was responsible for both BBC One and BBC Two. There was no question of me taking two years out to, uh, to go and do it. But at the same time, I thought, ah, oh, pretty, good, pretty good job, <laughs> pretty good little number to have. And after I'd been in, uh, in administration for eight years, four years on BBC Two and four years as director of programmes, I reckoned uh, that I could take time out and perhaps and the piano was paid for and one way or another, maybe I could go and do that. So I, I resigned and one of the reasons for resigning was in order to be able to do a successor, which was eventually a series called Life on Earth.